Hey there, it's Kimberly from Keep the Tail Wagging, and this is going to be a video coming up with me and Scott J. Marshall II of um, Dog Dad Official and Raw Feeding 101, soon to be Raw Feeding 101 2.0. We are talking over the um, Dr. Karen Becker article, or article by Dr. Karen Becker, that lists five mistakes that raw feeders make. Um, we both shared this article earlier this week, and it caused a lot of stress for a lot of people who felt a bit um, discouraged. And I, we just wanted to basically do this article, go over each of our steps. This is not a we disagree. This is a take in the information um, and do what's right for your dog type of discussion. But ultimately... Um, this is great information for you to have. Dr. Karen Becker is one of the leaders in our community, so I do love it when she comes and brings like things like this to the table and spurs on discussions and conversations. So um, I hope you enjoy our chat together today. Talk to you later. Oh, yay. Okay. Hey, guys. It's me and Scott again. And today we are going to talk about um, Dr. Per Karen Becker's article, The Five Raw Food Mistakes to Avoid with Your Dog because we both shared this article in our groups, um, well, earlier last week, and yeah. we saw the complete meltdown from a lot of raw feeders who basically, in my group, I had a few people that were just like, well, I guess I won't be refeeding raw anymore because I don't know how to do it and this is too hard. Um, a lot of people who you know, disagreed with what she had to say, a lot of people who agreed with what she had to say, um, I think it's one of those things that I think both Scott and I agree on is just like with everything else out there in the world, and I hope you can't hear barking in the background, but like with everything else out in the world, um, you know, you can agree with some things and disagree with some things, but ultimately it just comes down to our dogs. So what were your initial thoughts, Scott? Well, my initial thoughts were, what is everybody freaking out about in my group? Because <laughs> I shared the I shared the post second in my group. It was actually a group member that shared it first. That's how I saw it for the first time. And I was like, okay, it's we're only like three or four comments in, and people are already throwing. Yeah. It. That's when I know that it's going to be one of those eighty comment long threads, and everybody's going to be mad. Is when three or four comments in and people are already upset. <clears throat> so I was like, okay, I can't even read this right now because I don't have time because I'm working. So I've been put into the comment thread. I'm putting a notation in to read this later and then I'll comment about it. And by the time that I came back, it was, it was a catastrophe. I mean, people are freaking out exactly what you're saying. Like, well, I guess I won't be feeding raw anymore. And now I'm way too scared to even start. And I was like, oh, okay. I really, really need to read through this article. <laughs> so I read through it, and what I thought initially was that this is going to freak people out, and it is going to scare people. Sorry, dry throat. Yep, me too. But I actually had the, the knee-jerk reaction, like I think a lot of people did, where they saw something in Dr. Becker's article that was basically something that they were doing that she was addressing as a mistake, right? Yeah. And you have that human knee-jerk reaction to go on the defensive and get upset. And there was about a half of a moment of that for me when it got to the feeding only uh, meat section. And I was like, okay, no, you're, we're going about this all wrong already. This is what the people in those first three or four comments were doing. And they were just getting upset without actually thinking it through. Yeah. And so that was my initial impression, I guess, was going, ugh, that's what I'm doing. I won't do meat. But I think that what really people should have been doing is looking at it as an opportunity to reassess yeah. what can I be doing better. You know, just like I say at the end of all of my videos, you don't have to be perfect. Just try to improve as you go forward. So what can I take from this article that is a simple step or an easy step to make things better and provide more balance, et cetera. So I guess that was my first reaction. Yeah. And it's funny because I remember when you messaged me to let me know, uh-oh, <laughs> what's happening. <laughs> Scott sent me a link to the article. I read it and I was just like, oh, I want to have fun too. So I went ahead and shared it to my group. And sure enough, yeah, the first few comments, in fact, 
There was a comment um, yesterday already from someone who um, shared the article again in the group and said, I guess I'm not gonna, I'm just, I'm just about to go back to the store and go back to store food because um, I'm not gonna be able to do this. And that day, like, and it's so funny because Scott let me know about the article, let me know the reaction to it. And I went ahead and happily shared it anyway while at work. <laughs> and within an hour, I was leaving work to go and hide in another building to do a Facebook Live. <laughs> Just huh. to calm everyone down because apparently I didn't believe Scott. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, it won't be that bad. But I thought we can go through each of the, it's just five mistakes, and we would go through each of the mistakes, and Scott and I would share just our thoughts. And so before we go through each one, I was just going to read each one off to folks watching. Um, if you don't know the article, it's five raw food mistakes to avoid with your dog. And I'm sure both of us, when we have this up on our YouTube and social media, we'll have a link to the article in our notes. But yep. mistake number one is not understanding the basics of canine nutrition. I printed it out. Mistake number mm -hmm. two is feeding only raw meat. Number three is forgetting roughage. Number four is ignoring the potential need for supplements. And number five is letting safety concerns scare you. So, number one, not understanding the basics of canine nutrition, I wholeheartedly agree. Yep. But I don't think any of us truly understand the basics of canine nutrition, other than we've all agreed that kibble isn't part of the equation. But it's not easy to learn how to feed our dogs because there isn't... Um, you know, it's not like we can go to the pet store and the salespeople there are going to break down what biologically appropriate is and walk us to the freezer and say, you know, you need some, here's some muscle meat, here's some organ meat, and, and this is what offal is, and, you know, and hey, do you want to add vegetables? Well, here's our vegetable section. So let's talk about which ones you need and the vitamins that they are going to contribute to the diet. Hey, are you adding enough zinc? Well, let's talk about what foods you can get zinc. No one... Nowhere in my life is going to hold my hand and walk me through these steps. They're just going to walk me to the, um, you know, pet food aisle and show me the different bags and what's on special and that's it. And when in within the raw community, yes, we're learning from other raw feeders. We're learning from veterinarians um, and nutritionists online. But I think we all agree that all the information is completely different. So yeah, it's like, so no, none of us know the basics of canine nutrition. No, yeah. and I don't remember if this is, I think this, her statement about the 80-10-10 thing is actually in a different um, yeah. section, but I think that it ties into this first one really well, where that's why I say all the time, you say all the time, you know, in every platform that we have, whether it's in your book my course, our Facebook pages, our Instagrams, whatever it is, we're always talking about educating yourself. And that's why we always say that, you know, the, and just like uh, Karen Becker said, the 80, 10, 10 stuff is a good starting point yeah. while you're getting started and you're learning about more stuff while you're continuing to educate yourself. It kind of freaks me out when, um, doesn't really freak me out, I guess, but when I see somebody hop into my group and they're like, all right, well, I want to start feeding raw. Here's this list of 30 things that I'm going to go and get <laughs> in a couple of days. And I just like, I just want to go, whoa, bear. Whoa. What slow. supplement should I add? <laughs> exactly. Like, just should I mix down. kibble in this to make it balanced? <laughs> yeah. And it, I, there might be some people in the raw feeding community and world that would want to put me up on a pike for saying this, but <laughs> I, would rather, I would rather you stayed on kibble for the next six months then yes. have no idea what you are doing and just start feeding raw tomorrow. Right. Because if you're not educating yourself and you don't at least figure out the basics of, okay, I need to eventually get to this whole 80, 10, 10 thing. And then keep educating myself. If you don't start there, you are going to be doing more bad than good. You know what? When I add people to the group, I'll go and look at their profile. And I'm just like, all right, is this, even just at face value, is this the kind of person that I want in my community? Mm -hmm. And I see sometimes people that are feeding nothing but hamburger. And I just want to go, and it almost makes me cringe to say it, but I'm like, just feed Purina, please. <laughs> like, well, wow. and it's interesting because um, I don't feed my cat a raw diet, but what you just said reminded me of 
um, when Cosmo, when I was feeding, when I had two cats and I was feeding them kibble, you know, I would get a lot of flack from people and I would tell them, hey, I tried to feed them raw. I tried to feed them canned. They would just starve themselves. And years ago, I had a cat go off food. And so I know how quickly they go downhill and they basically, their organs shut down and they die. And I was terrified of that happening. So I was just like, I guess I'll just keep, I mean, at least they'll eat it. And finally, um, someone actually, I won't say their name, but someone who <laughs> owns a raw feeding brand sent me an email actually and said, hey, you know, give me a call. Let's talk. I have an idea for you. And so I called her up and she said, go to this store and buy Purina, buy the fancy feast, buy whatever you want. And I was just like, what? And she's like, yeah, she's like, just buy that. Because to be perfectly honest, your cat will be healthier on that than on kibble. She's like, that is how bad kibble is for cats. And she's like, and also it'll at least let you know if your cat will eat canned food. And I did, and of course, you know, by then I only had one cat because Jaffrey had passed away, not because of Kipple. And um, he devoured it, loved it. And then what my trick was to slowly transition him, it was quick off of Kipple to Purina, but then slowly transition him from Purina to a higher grade um, can or pouched cat food. But it, it is, I've heard that from a lot of people. And I did the same thing where I fed my dogs, I was, even though I knew about raw and was researching raw, I was feeding kibble for several months before I went from half raw, half kibble. And then I did that until I ran out of kibble. And then I did pre-made kibble or pre-made raw until I figured out how to do DIY. And, and I'm grateful. It's like, although now knowing what I know now, I would just jump into feeding a dog a raw diet. But back then, you know, I didn't know what I was doing, but I'm glad that I took my time because not once did I, um, you know, rush to the hospital basically because I hurt my dog because I was feeding an unbalanced diet. Right. So, right. But the next one, feeding only raw meat. So that one goes to the 80-10-10. And I think both you and I have said this many times of the 80-10-10 is where we start. It's not where we finish. It's just a way to get us going. It's the same with how much we feed our dogs. We use the raw food calculators as a starting point, and then we adjust based on a specific dog's needs. The idea that every dog on this planet should be fed 80-10-10 is um, not accurate. All dogs are different. And I think people forget that the 80-10-10, it wasn't so much that this is a balanced diet Someone decided that when a wolf or a wild dog took down prey, 80% of the prey was muscle meat, 10% was bone, 5% was offal, 5% was liver. That's where we get those ratios from. So yes, just start there. Don't think that you're doing that and so, oh, I'm done. Yeah, I mean, because if you start there, if you start there and you stop there, then you're really missing out on a lot of things. And I'm kind of, even now, you know, seven years in, still flirting with that line, but didn't stop there. You know, yeah. my dog won't. They just won't. I've tried mackerel. I've tried, <laughs> I mean, every kind of fish that you can think of that is, you know, safe to feed to your yeah. dogs. They just refuse it. They absolutely will not. The one time that they even got it down because I left it with them for long enough, it immediately came back up and it was just like, no, this just isn't for us. <laughs> but they need omega threes in their diet. Mm -hmm. So if I can't get it to them naturally by using just meat, doing 80, 10, 5, 5, I have to supplement that or else they're missing out on stuff. And so I feed fish oil. And then we take another step farther. All right, so how do we utilize this omega three even more? Okay, well, now let's start supplementing coconut oil with the MCTs that help deliver the omega-3s throughout the body. And it's just one step at a time trying to make things better. Uh, another example, looking at Horace constantly, like constantly since the day that I got him from nine weeks old. And so I know that it's not because he got switched to raw or anything like that. But since he was nine weeks old, he has always had issues with yeast. Always, always, always. When he was younger, he used to have him. It, makes it look so much worse because he's white yeah. has had the whole goob line thing going on that's long since gone away but it's all it's transitioned to his ears and his paws and after speaking uh with thomas sandberg of longlivingpets.com 
we started feeding or supplementing a pH adjust supplement to help balance that out. And it's helped a lot. Wow. So getting 80, 10, 5, 5, I think is that really the 101 stuff. You need yeah. to start there, get balanced out with the, you know, base need things. You need your micronutrients and macronutrients with all the stuff you're getting from organ and liver. You need your base calcium, phosphorus from bones and everything else. And you need your proteins from your meat. But then you need to keep going and continue educating yourself. Yeah. And I think, you know, in the article, she touches on, you know, like alternating proteins. And, you know, for, for me, who lives in a part of the country where I am a member of a raw food co-op and I have, you know, to me, the fact that I'm only feeding three proteins is, oh, the horror. Whereas there are <laughs> people who literally only have one or two proteins. And so they have no choice but to feed lots and lots of chicken. And, um, you know, and we, I think, understand that because of our, you know, the food industry as it is, if you're getting your chicken from factory farms, you're getting chickens that are going to, basically the meat is going to be inflammatory in your dog's system, cause all kinds of issues. That's why we're seeing so many animals um, that, you know, have the appearance of having a chicken intolerance. But, you know, it's, while I think that, yeah, ideally we should alternate proteins, if you're new to raw feeding or if you reach a point in, you know, like a time of the year where you just don't have access to a whole heck of a lot, don't kill yourself. It's like, yeah. you know, ultimately it's like we need to do the best we can. I think when it comes to like the Dr. Karen Beckers and the Rodney Habibs and the Dogs Naturally magazines, you know, um, Dr. Peter DeBias, these people are... I think responsible for pre presenting an entire world view of raw feeding. Yeah. So when we take in that information, it can seem a bit overwhelming and it can seem like rules, like, oh crap, we need to feed more than chicken, but I don't have anything more than chicken, so I better go get this bag of lamb kibble and start feeding that. And it's not necessary. It's just like, try, try and do it. And there are ways to do it where, um, for instance, for a long time, I couldn't feed pork because I didn't have a good source for pork. So I got a pre-made pork. I'm a member of a co-op, so I was able to get it at a, a lower cost. You know, fish, if you can feed fish, fish is another protein. I wouldn't feed it as a whole meal, but it does add variety to a dog's diet. And um, for meats that I can't, my dogs, well, Rodrigo can't eat beef, turkey, or chicken raw, but he can't eat them cooked. So a way for me to get those proteins in his diet is to cook them and create, create a cooked meal. And I'll have to add more supplements to it because I'm cooking out nutrients. But it's, I think it's a matter of being a little more creative and keeping in mind that we don't eat a balanced diet, you know, as, <laughs> as we balance over time. So it is okay for our dogs to balance over time. So long story short, do the best that you can. Don't kill yourself. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that the, the second and the third mistake are kind of, the same thing really where yeah. she's saying meat only and don't forget the rough edges kind of mm -hmm. the same thing of trying to fill all of the gaps in the yeah. diet yeah. and i think this is after actually reading uh reading that article and going and doing some more research um i kind of i think i read one of your articles too on keep the tail wagging but i started thinking i wonder if horace is experiencing a zinc uh, deficiency. Yeah. No, started getting really scaly. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, I know that I can feed eggs to provide a good amount of zinc yeah. and add in some additional calcium as well to kind of offset this. Um, the pH adjust has been making their stools a little soft. Mm -hmm. and so I started giving eggs again daily and almost immediately the scaling started to reduce on horse's nose, the poops firmed up and everything like that. So I think that as long as we are observing our dogs and not yeah. just being comfortable in one thing and refusing to change and letting our egos get in the way, as long as we keep observing and adjusting as necessary, yeah. then we're doing the best we can. Because if you really think about this, we are in, yeah, there are some people out there that have been doing this in one form or another for 15, 20 plus years, right? Yeah. But... When they started, it was probably the 0.1% of people doing it. It's that much. Right. And now we're talking about this whole 4% of us feed fresh food thing. 
and we're really in the beginning stages mm -hmm. and we're really just you know pulling at hairs and pulling at strings trying to figure this whole thing out we have lots of sources we have lots of resources like dogs naturally magazine we have lots of resources like your blog and everything else but really we're in the beginning stages yeah you know it's like looking at the difference 15 years from now it's going to be the difference between the wright brothers and going into space for the first time <laughs> like it's all a flight yeah. it's completely different in 20 years it's going to be most people i hope in 20 yeah. years at least 50 percent of people are going to be doing this because it's so obvious to do it yeah. and we're going to have figured out a lot a better way to do it that's more sure that lets right. you Find those gaps easier, quicker, and fill them in a, an inexpensive or at least affordable way. So right now we're just kind of, we're the beginners, yeah. right? <laughs> Even if we've been doing it for four to seven years, we're the beginners. We're figuring it out. And so, yeah, and just about the roughage in the vegetables. And I remember, you know, because it says here, a good rule of thumb is to keep produce content less than 25% of the diet. But most people, um, you know, they focused on 25% of the diet, like it needs to be 25% of the diet. And it starts with maned wolves have been reported to consume up to 38% plant matter during certain times of the year. So, I mean, it's, you know, I get it, you know, and people are like, I'm not feeding 25% of my dog's diet as vegetables. And then you have the people who are like, I've been feeding raw for this many years and I've never done that. It's unnecessary. And um, I think, you know, it goes to what you just said, which is like, we need to be open to new information yep. and we need to partner that with what we know about our dogs. And one thing that I constantly tell people is, you know, I've been doing this for four years and I have had many, many people come to me with their 10, 15, 20, 25 years of experience in raw feeding and tell me I'm doing it wrong. And my <laughs> only response, you know, that I think of is that, they have zero experience with my dogs. I'm the one that's the expert in my dog. So while I can take that information that they're sharing in, I still need to file it away and figure out how I need to use it with my dogs or if I need to use it with my dogs. So while I do add um, vegetables to my dog's diet, I don't just, I don't do it the way I did. It's like you just said, you know, we're changing. I mean, what, two years ago, maybe two or three years ago, I posted a blog post that still gets a lot of traffic about my veggie mix. And people still e email me about my veggie mix. What they don't know is I hardly make it anymore. I do puree up vegetables and stuff and mix it into their food. But my reason for doing so has changed drastically. And I've gone from the person who felt that, um, you know, I used to think that I had to reduce the meat to, I was like to 65 to 75% and make it up with vegetables because that's what right. I was taught. I've changed that to, nope, I'm still going to feed 80%, but then I'm going to add vegetables on top to now I feed vegetables because I have some or because Sydney's on a diet and this is going to help her feel full. And that's why, you know, I feed <clears throat> vegetables or they're like a carrier for something else. So I'm, I'm mixing it into bone broth and things like that and adding it into their food. So it's, um, things have changed so much for me, but my big, the biggest change is my um, growing understanding of fermented value vegetables and their value. So that's what I think is really important. And one person, I believe, I don't know, I got confused after a while, so I don't know if this was in your group or my group, but one person said that if you're going to feed vegetables um, and if you're going to go by, um, you know, in the wild, they would eat this. Um, and someone was like, you know, shaking out the stomach contents, but there's still going to be some in the lining, but that's going to be, you would need to basically ferment it to make it have the same value that they would eat in the wild. And it's just like, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> That's right. That's what everyone's been talking about and the probiotic values and everything like that. And she didn't talk about um, fermented vegetables in here, but my long rant or I'm not really ranting, but blah, 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 is simply that we're still learning. I mean, there's so, everyone is adding vegetables for different reasons. I think we can all agree that there is a value, whether it be nutrients, whether it be weight loss, whether it be roughage and fiber or um, probiotics, um, yep. there is value, but how you choose to add them to your dog's diet is really up to you and what you wanna do, what you have access to. 
um, and what you find is valuable. Because while there are some dogs that do great on vegetables, my dogs are dogs that do great on vegetables, there may be other dogs that are going to do better on, on minimal vegetables or certain types of vegetables or fermented veg. I mean, it's just try it out, figure it out, and figure out what's work, what works for you. And um, don't, you know, don't freak out. Yeah. I think that's the worst mistake. That should, that should have been mistake number six. The bonus mistake is overthinking and freaking out. I mean, there's, there's really a fine line between, um, you know, properly, properly <laughs> educating yourself before you start and obsessing and yeah. never starting or freaking yourself out so bad that you're just constantly thinking of all the damage that you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mean, Really, I think that's the worst mistake people can make is stressing themselves out and let it be too hard. You know, yeah, there's some learning that you need to do. You need to educate yourself first, but it's not rocket science as much as some people want to make it out. <laughs> yeah. It's, like, it's one of those where, and I, I said this, I think I said it in my video, where I take in everything. And I have my little file cabinet and I file away. Some things I file it away to look at later because I'm looking at it and like, ah, oh, this doesn't apply to me right now. So I'm gonna file it again later and pull it out and relook at it. But I, you know, I do understand being frustrated because back when, you know, earlier this year when they were talking about we need to balance fats, and I'm just like, <laughs> what? No one said anything about this. I don't think anyone in the history of raw feeding has been thinking about balancing fats. What the heck does this mean? And that is frustrating because it's like now you're being told that you need to buy all these different oils and you need to add this oil when you feed this thing and 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 I felt that I wasn't given enough background on why I needed to do that yeah. or being told that, however, if you do this, you don't have to worry about this. And I had to dig a little to find it. So I think with this article and any other article that we come across, and we are going to come across them, we have to be able to dig. And sometimes digging is just asking other raw feeders, hey, do you do this? Do you add vegetables? Do you balance fats? Are you adding oysters for zinc? I mean, and finding out what other people are doing and then, you know, sitting on it a little bit to see if does this work for me? Because it, it does get overwhelming. Even I've been doing this, I have a book and I still get overwhelmed. I mean, I'm always worried now that my book is going to become obsolete because someone's going to publish something that's going to be like, yep, everyone's this wrong. One? Hey. This one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one. <laughs> That book. <laughs> so the next one is about supplements. And this one, I find it's funny because I don't see this so much today of people saying, oh, you don't need to add supplements. I think I see more of with the new raw feeders who are like, what supplements do I need? And all of us saying, okay, slow down. Let's get the food, okay, and then we'll get going with supplements. And but yeah, you're when I started feeding raw, um, I had either two camps, either people were giving me laundry list of supplements, things that I totally didn't need um, and telling me I had to do all of this. And then other people saying that I didn't need any supplements and I was just wasting my money and potentially harming my dog. And I, and today after this, you know, the years of what I'm doing, I completely get it because ideally our dog should be able to get everything from their diet. So um, fish oil, um, I can add fish oil or I can add um, raw sardines. I can add, um, 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 you know, a joint supplement or I can add, you know, duck feet and beef trachea um, and, you know, golden paste. I can't, you know, it's like, it's one of those things where we can get it here, but we can also, if it's fresh food, that's fine. I think the difference is what our dogs will eat and if we have access to it. And if you, if your dog, like raw eggs, I give my dogs raw eggs every other day because to me, that's their multivitamins. If they would not eat them, then I would have to go and add something that is going to make up the nutrients that they're losing by not having those raw eggs. Um, okay. But it's just sort of like, I think the idea that our dogs don't need any supplements, you know, every now and then I see someone come out with that. And I think that, yeah. If I have a super, super healthy dog, I don't need to, to throw a bunch of supplements at them, but I always try to remember that I'm not raising a wolf, I'm raising a domesticated dog. 
So while I'm trying to replicate a diet of a wolf, I'm still raising a, rep, a domesticated dog. So they're going to need stuff um, that a wolf may not need. Also, wolves know where to get what they need. My dogs don't, I don't always. So that's where the supplements come in. Yeah, and there's two points that I wanna make about this whole supplement thing and you know wolves in the wild. And the first one is I was reading or listening rather to, um, I think that it's called How Dogs Work or something like that. That sounds familiar. Yeah, if you look for it on Audible, it'll be um, a picture of a tiny little pit bull puppy and he's just the cutest little thing ever. But um, I was listening to that book and it was hours and hours and hours long. And one of the things that it talked about was, uh, you know, the comparison between wolves and domesticated dogs. And one thing that it listed was, only, I think that it was 80% of wolves die before they reach um, young adulthood. Oh, wow. So, yeah, 80% of them. So I think that just looking at what a wolf eats isn't enough to, you know, model everything just mm -hmm. on that. We need to pick and choose what information that we pull out of there because if we're looking at what wolves are eating, 80% of them are dying. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, they're not dying from cancer, but it's something to think about. Just because the wolf did this doesn't mean that it's absolutely perfect. You know, the whole 38% being a uh, roughage of some kind mm -hmm. at certain times, that was when food was thin and they had to eat that to live. Yeah. You know, uh, on the thing of supplements, dry mouth, slippery elm bark, George Washington and his homies for I don't know how long, I think it was, they survived an entire winter eating nothing but this gruel that was made out of water and slippery elm bark. So it's like, there's a difference between thriving and okay, I can eat that and not die. <laughs> and the other thing is, I saw a lot of people when this article came out that were saying things like, um, every time that uh, Dr. Becker puts out an article, it's only to sell things and there's always a yeah. supplement or a something else that she's selling to, you yeah. know, alleviate your concerns that she created in her article and it's like okay I, I can get where you were looking I can get where you're coming from saying that because yeah. in this article she talks about uh I can't remember how what she calls it but some type of supplement like a multivitamin or whatever it was that she says that can mm -hmm. help fill these gaps in the diet right and I think that that's just completely completely wrong the wrong way to look at it right it, just because she happens to have and works with a company that can supplement and help solve this problem doesn't mean that she's doing it just to make money. Yeah. I mean, she, there's a problem that exists. None of us can argue that these problems that she's talking about don't exist. Just because she has a solution to the problem doesn't mean that she's money grubbing. It right. means that she lives in the world that we live in she has to make money to survive like all of us do. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, but if you're one of those people that are out there saying that everybody that has anything to do with raw should be doing all of it for free, are you going to work for free? Yeah. That's my question to you. And I bet the answer is not no, because yeah. you're either working or someone's working for you. <laughs> and I think that it's one of those things where, um, cause you and I have spoken about this many times and it's a huge pet peeve of mine where um, people look down on someone who's making a living and forgetting the um, tremendous amount of things that she does for free. Like this yeah. article is free and she does a lot on social media that's free. A lot of Facebook lives where she's giving away a lot of really great information for free. And I've yeah. seen her um, at interacting with people at events. And this is a person who will sit down with someone and educate them on things and help them answer a question and give them feedback. And, um, you know, she's not diagnosing pets or anything at Super Zoo, but she is, if someone has a question, she is answering questions and helping people. And she isn't, you know, saying, oh, buy my book or, well, these aren't office hours or anything like that. And, and I think that um, that's one of those things where, you know, if we want to, it's sort of like with my blog, for my blog to remain free, for everyone to come and read the content, I have to make money somewhere else. 
And so I'm going to recommend products. I'm only going to recommend the products that I believe in. And I feel the same way about Dr. Becker. I feel that when she recommends a product, I trust her. So I trust that the product she's recommending is a good thing. Now it's up to me to do my own homework to decide if I want to actually spend the money and that product is going to be right for my dog. Because it may not be, but I'm not going to be mad at her for trying to make money off of it. I think, yeah. you know, I think we should step away from, from the, from, I guess, the judgmental statements. I saw in my group, someone posted an article about um, Dr. Merkula and basically was saying, you know, from what this article says, he's pretty shady, which leads one to believe that Dr. Becker is shady as well. And again, it's not as a um, critique on the person who shared that because that is what we should be doing. We should be questioning the leaders in our community. Um, we just have to also understand that this is a 60 billion plus industry. And a lot of people are choosing in their marketing campaigns to tear down others. It's how they ultimately are going to fill their bank accounts is right. why when they see, you know, when it comes to like, I wrote an um, article about, you know, Bloomberg wrote an article about, and they compared pedigree and the honest kitchen. And in their article, they're just sort of like, it's rolling their eyes at the cost of the honest kitchen because you can get this in pedigree. And <laughs> it's like, what? And, but that is what this industry does. They are using that type of logic of saying, these people are trying to fleece you. They only want to get your money. They're going to scare you so that you buy their products. This is what they're doing to create infighting within the raw feeding community, to create distrust and to um, stoke fear in their you know, clients and their customers by saying things like raw feeders aren't clean and how our dogs are gonna get or die from the bacteria. And those are the things that they're doing. So be careful about the articles that you read that are super, super negative and maybe look and see who sponsored that article. Because right. one, another article that I read that was a critique of the film Pet Fooled, well, this person is sponsored by Bainfield um, Pet Hospitals. That's owned by Mars Pet Care. What do you know? <laughs> you know, I don't think that they are going to be a fan of the movie Pet Fooled. So, so it's just sort of like, you know, it's one of those things where, yes, you should read those articles. You know, it's important to have a, a well-rounded view of everyone and, what, and question their motivations. Right. But just keep in mind that this is a dog eat dog world. And unfortunately, just because someone has a website or someone posted an article does not make it true or yeah. biased or, you know, <clears throat> fair and balanced or, you know, it's, you know, it's very biased. And it's basically people are just trying to, you know, they're just trying to protect their brand. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And yeah. just one more note on the um, Karen Becker making money off of supplements and all this kind of stuff, uh, specifically this article. I mean, really, would you rather that this highly qualified, highly educated, raw advocate veterinarian knew about these problems and didn't tell you about them? Yeah. Or would you rather she told you about them and offered you a solution? Exactly. And if money gets pulled out of that equation, you would choose the tell me so that I can fix it every time. Yeah. It, and yeah. it's, it's funny because years ago, there was a, um, I asked a question about a supplement, and this is when I was still feeding kibble, very brand new to all of this. And I asked a question on my Facebook page, like, if you have a dog that has bad arthritis, and someone gives you a supplement that works, but the supplement costs $40 a month, would you pay for it? And I was stunned that most people said yes you have no idea what it's like to have a dog in pain. If that is all it took is to give my dog relief, then absolutely, that's a great price. And that really opened my eyes to the fact that maybe I wouldn't pay money for a certain supplement because um, I just don't see the value in it. But that doesn't mean other people wouldn't have great value in it. So it's just sort of like, you know, it's okay to say, oh, I'm not really, I'm not feeling that one. I'm not gonna buy it. Like for instance, krill oil. I think krill oil is really expensive and I'm just not willing to pay the money for it. And I really just give my dog sardines and I buy Bonnie and Clyde fish oil. And, um, but that doesn't mean that I don't think krill oil is good and has value. I'm just not willing to pay the money for it. It's just, it, I haven't been convinced yet. And so, but you know, it's just, 
take the information. You don't have to pay for a supplement. Just take the information, apply it to you. And, you know, maybe later on you'll find value in the supplement or something similar. Yep. So the mm -hmm. last one is letting safety concerns scare you, which, you know, for me, I don't see that a lot in my group where people are worried about um, every now and then a question comes up. But for the most part, I think that um, even people new to raw feeding recognize that, yeah, I wash my hands. And <laughs> you know, so there, you know, there aren't that many people who are um, afraid of, um, you know, getting sick, you have their dog getting sick. I ha I did get an email from someone who has kids. She has a baby and a toddler and a baby on the way and she has a dog and she wants to feed the dog raw and she's wondering, you know, what do I do? What if the dog licks the baby? And, and I was reading this email like, yeah, you're talking to a person who, if a kid comes running to me that's not related to me, I'm just like, ew, yuck. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I have no, when I see people post tons and tons of pictures of their kids on Instagram, you are risking me unfollowing you because I'm there for the puppies and the dogs. So I'm not <laughs> the last person on the world because I'm just sort of like, okay. And I honestly had to say, you know, you need to join a raw feeding group because there are tons of people in there that are raising kids. <laughs> oh, and yay. Hi guys. <laughs> Boy, you're supposed to be outside. <laughs> Hi, buddy. That's Zoe. And she. <laughs> okay, so she's done. So, <laughs> but um, so I, you know, I heard... people know you really have dogs, and you're not just lying about it. <laughs> I, know. I know. I don't really have dogs for years. I've just been lying. <laughs> I took a bunch of pictures four years ago, and I've just been cycling through them. <laughs> I know. <laughs> now you know <laughs> but um so yeah I just I don't know kids and because my dogs lick me all the time I actually had someone send me a message telling me that it was really unsanitary for me to allow my dogs to lick me and I was like okay and um but I don't know like because a kid's you know immune system isn't fully developed especially a baby and so I don't know I honestly don't know I would just say feed your dog and maybe keep your kid in a different room or I don't know and so I encourage them to go and speak to other parents. But I think with any fear that we have, um, I encourage people to ask questions, find someone that you trust or ask in a community. And then on the flip side, I encourage the community to be open to those questions, even if we're seeing them day after day after day, because um, it's valid. It's a valid fear. And if what we're trying to do ultimately is increase that 4% to 5% to 10%, we have to basically, um, you know, break down those fears and let people know, hey, this actually isn't a worry. This is what I do at my house, you know, and um, help people take the next step. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, around our house and this, I don't know where this came from. I couldn't tell you if you literally had a gun to my head. I couldn't tell you. I don't know if it just was made up in my brain one day, if I just noticed one day, if I heard it in a group seven years ago, or I don't know what, but around here, we just have like the one hour rule where for an hour after you get done with dinner, there's no kisses. There's no kisses. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds like we haven't been sick yet. And all the people that I recommended it to, no one's gotten sick yet. Mm -hmm. I think really that of, other than the parents is a really good example for a valid concern and I wouldn't have a super great answer for it either because if the if Horace comes and licks my hand right after he got done having dinner I know I'm not going to put my hand in my mouth before <laughs> I touch my hand but that doesn't mean that a five-year-old not going to because yeah. their head is not there but other than really really good examples like that I think the majority of people that are freaking out about my dog's going to get salmonella and then he's going to give it to me and we're all going to die. Yeah. I think that a large amount of that either comes from people that aren't feeding raw in dog specific groups where it yeah. comes up non non raw dog specific groups where it comes up that somebody feeds raw and they basically attack them saying somebody in your house is going to get sick. Yeah. And the articles that those people probably read yeah. from somebody like you know mars that's sponsoring that article saying here's all the dangers of raw feeding or like that bbc, Costco, that BBC video 
absolute <laughs> yeah exactly like i it makes me almost sad because how many thousands of people yeah. watch that video that were ignorant to the fact again i know that ignorant holds a lot of negativity but it really yeah. just means uninformed yeah. but a lot of ignorant people that maybe they would have fed raw but then watch this video from some quack mm -hmm. and now they're never going to do it because they're just too afraid yeah yeah absolutely yeah so it's just sort of like i'm i'm glad that out of all five of the mistakes that's one mistake that i'm seeing people like that didn't come up in any of the discussions the the biggest things that came up was basically um the vegetables and the balance everyone was terrified of not having a balanced diet and so as a big reminder we balance over time and you know going back to thomas sandberg of longlivingpets.com you know when we had our like epic conversation where we're just chattering forever he's so amazing um he said we balance over time you know and so everything that we're doing today is so much better than feeding a processed dry dog food diet we are like giving our dogs such a great diet today so if we learn that hey maybe i need to check how much zinc they're getting in their diet and make adjustments that's okay we don't have to learn about zinc and then have a heart attack because we haven't been adding oysters all these years it's just a oh mm -hmm. zinc. okay well let me look into that and let me maybe this is a conversation if i have a um a, a raw friendly vet to talk to them about and how can we test this and what can i do and um it's just I think it's one of those where even I am learning to take in information and um, say, oh, that's interesting, because I have, I have two best friends. And um, Katrina always reminds me that for seven to nine years, she only fed chicken to her dog. And it, it was like one cut of chicken, like she would go get a family pack of chicken and that's what her dogs ate. And they were fine. And then my other girlfriend, Tina, um, she is the one that whenever something comes out, um, she's we're on messenger back and forth trying to figure it out. Like, do we need to do this? What should we do? How should we do it? What do you think this means? And so it's sort of like I have both sides of it where one of my friends is always reminding me, hey, this is what I did. I did everything that they're telling us not to do and I did it for almost 10 years and my dogs were fine. So if you aren't doing everything that you think you should be doing that this article says that we should be doing um your dogs are going to be fine it's, yeah. to me, it's mm. the people who are only feeding ground beef or people who are seeing obvious signs of a lack and not addressing it so your dog is very underweight and losing hair um yeah you know, doesn't have a good gait or, you know, maybe having trouble standing and, you know, basically having health issues that a dog, a healthy dog would not have on a raw diet. And it's because you're only feeding ground beef, then yeah, and you're just not addressing it. That is a problem. But if you're doing your best to give your dog everything that your dog needs, then I find that you're, you're in the balanced over time lane. And so you're going to be okay. Yeah. And I hate to end this off here, but my phone's screaming at me saying I want to cut off. So thank you so much. Thank you everyone for watching us. Um, this is Scott from Raw Feeding 101. Stay tuned for Raw Feeding 101.2, <laughs> or is it 2.0, coming 2 out. <laughs> and, um, check me out, um, keepthetailwaggy.com, and on Amazon right now is a raw, a quick start, nope, a novice's guide to raw feeding for dogs. I know the name of my book. Um, and thanks for watching us, and we will talk to you guys later. So.